Order, order, settle down, settle down. You're not in the House of Commons now. Welcome to Potter Street Baptist Church on our service today. My name is Murray Kitson, Deacon for the day. Now, like my fellow Deacon Paul Channel, two N's or two L's, I have arranged for good weather today. Welcome to our service, which is being led by our Minister in Training, Tim West. Over to you, Tim. Good morning, everybody, and welcome from me, Tim West, your Minister in Training. I'll be leading our service this morning on this Palm Sunday. Now, despite the lockdown, we gather as one body this morning and we choose to share prayer, worship, reflection and the Bible together. At the end, Alison will lead us in a short communion, the Lord's Supper. So please have some bread and some wine ready as we share together. Let me just pray. Father God, we ask you to bless our time together as your people, as your disciples. We want to know you better. We want to love you better. And so make this service this morning and the online fellowship afterward part of that experience. Search us, God. Speak to us. We ask you to leave us excited this morning as we see you active in our lives. Amen. We come together for only one reason this morning, and that's to celebrate our God, to give him the thanks and the glory, just as that excited crowd did all those years ago as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on his donkey. His disciples grabbed whatever they could and waved it around. They threw coats in front of him. They shouted. They made a noise for their God. Let us do the same this morning. So please stand, sit, jump around as you want as we worship together this morning by singing Bless the Lord. strange time we are living in. I pray for my friends and family and for the time we can all get together again. 
I would also pray that the elderly in our church will not feel too alone. In Jesus' name, Amen. It's a Marian, 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 Amen. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my back garden. And welcome to another week of adapting to the different, different way we are doing church. I've had to adapt to the way I shop, the way I work, and over the years, I've had to adapt to the way I do my gardening. But that doesn't mean it's not happening. It means it's just happening differently. Here's my vegetable pot ready for my tomatoes and my onions to be sown. And it's ready now. And like Alison and Tim, bring us to a place before the service to be ready to receive him, often a place of choir or prayer. We have to be prepared to receive him. Our seeds might be sown, we might already have that faith, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have to care for our faith and nurture our faith. We have to ensure that we pray, that if possible we can read our Bible or listen to the Word of God. If we don't do that, our faith will never grow. And if our faith doesn't grow, we won't be able to share that faith with others, which is so, so important. We have to weed out everything that stops us from being the person God would want us to be. We have to weed out the things that stop us being good Christians. And no matter how you are feeling, the good thing to know is that you're not alone. And that no matter what we do, God is with us. He would not want us to worry. He would want everything that we have to flourish and grow like any good plant. He has told us he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. We are his children. Not all my seeds will grow. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. It's a Marian, Marian, Marian. Our reading this Palm Sunday is from Luke 19, verses 29 to 44. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, Why are you untying that colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. Hi everyone, it's Sarah here. Just wanted to sing you a song. Hopefully it works, and I don't sound too awful. Um, one we used to sing quite a lot, and haven't sung for a while, but I think it's pretty pertinent right now. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Faithful one, so unchanging Ageless one, you're my rock of peace 
Lord of all, I depend on you. I call out to you again and again. I call out to you again and again. You are my rock in times of trouble. down all through the storm your love is the anchor my hope is in you alone so unchanging ageless one you're my rock of peace lord of all i depend on you i call out to you Again and again, I call out to you. Again and again, you are my rock in times of trouble. Good morning. Can I ask you to call into your mind for a moment what sort of person you imagine Jesus to be as he was here on the earth all that time ago? If you were to meet him uh, in the flesh, I mean, given what you know about him, what impression do you think he would make on you if you'd been around him? What sort of person do you think he would be? When we use our imagination like that, most of us look for a starting point. For example, we know that he healed in amazing ways. So possibly that would be your Jesus, one that we would imagine leaves us awestruck at his power. A kind of how did he do that sort of response, a rush of excitement as we try and take in what just happens. John records that that triumphal entry of Jesus that Anne-Marie just read as coming right after Lazarus was raised from the dead. And there would have certainly been some excitement around uh, what Jesus had done as word got round. Or are we drawn as so many were, Nicodemus for example last week, to Jesus' wisdom and his learning and just the sheer depth of the man? The Gospels record over and over again how people were amazed at how he spoke and at his teachings. If you're thinking about the woman at the well or the woman caught in adultery, you might have in your mind a completely kind and compassionate Jesus, one who stood out amongst his peers for treating women with respect. And that's also the Jesus, isn't it, that has got time for children, for the vulnerable, uh, for the poor. You might even start with the authoritative Jesus that we saw in John 2 a few weeks ago. That's the radical Jesus, the upsetting Jesus, who takes action when his father is disrespected in his own house. Well, it's kind of a fun exercise, isn't it? And as we start it, and as we think about it, we realise that there are many sides to Jesus as recorded in the Gospels. 
It's wonderful, in fact, just how much we do know about him. There's so much to go on. And of course, getting to know the historical Jesus, the Jesus we read about, is a lifelong journey as we let it shape our view of him and our ideas about God. It was the disciples, of course, that had the privilege of a ringside seat, those lucky disciples. They had that front row for everything that went on. They didn't read it, they lived it. They were the eyewitnesses. In fact, they weren't on the sidelines looking on, were they? They were fully included by Jesus at every turn and brought into the story of God's visit to earth. And that story became theirs in a very real way. And they're there in our passage this morning, right in the middle of the action, as they've always been from the moment they met Jesus. And it seems like they at least have already made up their mind about Jesus. They've lived and breathed this man for the last three years. Their lives have been completely changed and they've got a new outlook on the world, a new perspective. All the things they thought were valuable to them, well, Jesus has shown them differently. They have new priorities now. Jesus is their first love. They're loving God through him. Sure, they've had their doubts, they've had their questions, but they've been wonderfully challenged and their faith has risen. And they might consider themselves in our passage at that moment more loyal to their master than ever before. All but one of them, of course. So Jesus, as Jesus comes towards the end of his life, the end of his work and his mission, they all know that their place is nowhere else other than right by his side, following him, living in obedience to him. It's no surprise to find two of them willing to do as Jesus asks. And as strange a request as it seems, they go off ahead to the entrance of a village to find a colt tied up. Of course, the owners of the cult were never going to see things quite like the disciples, and sure enough, they don't. Because Luke tells us that in the course of obeying Jesus, um, the disciples are challenged on what they're doing. Interesting to note, by the way, that this can happen today to us, in fact to anyone who is faithfully following Jesus. As we act in accordance with his will, uh, expect to meet challenges. Sure enough, the owners ask the disciples what they're up to. Well, you would, wouldn't you? But Jesus has prepared them well. And there's no problem, we're told, in borrowing it when they explain it's for the Lord. The owners may not know who Jesus is, like the disciples, but they're willing to go along with a kind of a a religious commandeering. And it happened from time to time. Rabbis would pull rank, so to speak. You can imagine maybe a little roll of the eyes from the owners who might wonder if they'll ever see it again. But for the disciples, it's just another reason to trust in Jesus and go along with whatever he has planned, whatever is in his mind this time, however crazy it might seem. Because Jesus knew that donkey would be there and the disciples knew that he knew all things. But it's what happens next, and it's what Jesus does next, that can seem strange and difficult for some of us, I guess, to fit alongside our ideas of Jesus. Now, on a first read, it's like Jesus is creating a bit of hype, even, in his name. And that doesn't sound like my Jesus at all. His disciples put their coats over the donkey, They put Jesus on top like some sort of cult hero and they continue with their parade, their journey, down the Mount of Olives. It was probably quite a fun moment for many people. Some threw their cloaks down, others cut branches from trees and waved them, all to signify this was a king, this was royalty passing through and on to Jerusalem. It sounds like a really strange scene. Why was Jesus allowing this? Weren't people getting caught up in the moment? Just a bit of religious hysteria, surely. For some, maybe. 
There would have been people there who really didn't know much about Jesus, for sure. The bystanders, people who just went along with it without any real understanding or connection to the royal visitor. There would have been people there who might just have even thought it was funny. They might have asked one of the disciples, what's going on then? Who's, who's the guy on the donkey? And the response of a disciple might have even been funnier to them. Oh, he's our king, coming in God's name to save us. Really? On a donkey? Yeah, right. But yes, really, be in no doubt, however bizarre it might seem, this was a moment designed by God as part of his rescue plan for those people. And also you and me. In Zechariah 9, in the Old Testament, written long before Jesus was even a twinkle in his parents' eyes, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. An amazing prophecy, 600 years before Jesus. This will happen, says God. Your king will come to you, Israel, to save you. But not a knight in shining armour on a gleaming steed, but in the most humble and lowly way you can imagine. Dressed plainly and riding on a donkey. A coming king, nevertheless. It's from verse 37 onwards that the challenge to us today arises. As Jesus comes down the Mount of Olives on his donkey and presses on towards Jerusalem, righteous and victorious, it's the disciples that really turn up the heat. Voices get raised, passions start to show themselves. God is praised with loud voices as people recall 
what God has done for them in their lives. The sick have been healed. Lazarus has just walked out of a tomb after four days. So far we've spoken about the disciples, those of a knowledge and passion for Jesus. We've spoken about the bystanders, those that have just stumbled into the area. They're on the scene but they're a bit bemused or just happy to go with, go along with the moment. Now in verse 39 we come to the Pharisees, the serious opposition to all of this foolishness. They're the ones that really object to this public display of praise and love for Jesus. Because for them, this is so not what they expect God to be like, to look like. But they are also the ones who have consistently missed the point right through Jesus' ministry. The disciples, in complete contrast, have opened their hearts to the coming kingdom and they've believed because they have seen. The Pharisees, who Jesus had constantly locked horns with and had refu they'd refused to believe in Jesus, in the teeth of the evidence that Jesus had given them. And again and again they'd acted in their own self-interests. And now they plotted to silence this threat once and for all. They shout out to him, Teacher, keep your followers under control. Well, Jesus' reply from the top of his donkey is absolutely priceless. And we can understand it today because we realise that all around was his creation. All around belonged to the guy on the top of the donkey. Jesus simply says to them, well, I could do, but the very stones would cry out, God is good, if the disciples weren't allowed to praise God. So let's be in no doubt about it today. God is ultimately an unavoidable reality. You can shut him out, you can turn your back, you can pretend or kid yourself he's not there. But his kingdom is coming, whether you're expecting it or not, whether you believe it or not. So the challenge is there for us now today. And it's this. Who are we in this scene? Where would we find ourselves? Where would we be? Well, for me, it's a four-way choice. Number one, there are some very wonderful law-abiding people in this world. They'll give a nod in the right place when asked, and they're decent law-abiding citizens. Just like the owners of that donkey, they'll toe the line as needed. But they're really just doing what they've always done, and they're missing out because they're not following Jesus directly. They're too happy just accepting the status quo, never really finding out more about this life and why they're living it. Then number two, there's the bystanders. Some of them, they're almost by accident. They might look on in puzzlement. They might have heard a bit about Lazarus and the stories, but by staying on the sidelines, they won't find out what's really going on. They're unlikely to encounter God in any meaningful way. Some might get caught up in the moment, but when the procession has passed by and Jesus has gone out of sight, as he is for you and me, it'll be business as usual for them. And they won't really have any real faith or belief in Jesus. Um, thirdly, we covered the Pharisees. And these are people who think they know best. They have received wisdom. They go along with what they've been taught. But they lack an open heart. And that really comes from serving their own interests. It's survival and power for them at any cost. And sadly, there are many today who would fall into that category. Well, if you're any of those people, know this. Jesus cries for you. The irony is that as Jesus comes near to the end of that joyful journey, a time where just for a few moments at least some people gave God a bit of love, the journey ends in tears for Jesus. Because verse 41, as Jesus, the King who has been hailed as Messiah by some, as he sees Jerusalem in the distance, he can't hold back his emotions anymore as to the impending destruction. 
He is God, he is Messiah, he knows all things. And he knows that this is not going to end well for the mass of people in front of him. And he knows it's not going to end well for him as well. So don't be mistaken, he's very much is not caught up in the moment or carried away with the adulation, none of that. He gives a very precise prophecy about the destruction of the city, which comes terribly true in AD 70 under the Roman Emperor Titus, who laid siege to the city and then pretty much destroyed it. And all that will happen, says Jesus, because you didn't recognise the time when God came to you. You didn't pick up your branches. You didn't throw your coats. You didn't shout Hosanna. You didn't make a noise for God. And you didn't believe in what I did or what I said. You didn't love me. In fact, you've rejected the very one sent to rescue you. Please, Lord, none of the above for me today. Hopefully, this Palm Sunday, you and I, we will count ourselves as one of Jesus' disciples, witnesses to his majesty, not just because what we've read about him, but because of our own walk with him and what he's done in our lives. Have a think for a moment. When was the last time you encountered God and sensed his presence? You had that tingle of excitement that the royal one is here. When were you last an eyewitness to his majesty in that way? If you consider your place in this scene today as one right next to Jesus, if you're the one that thinks you might be making the noise, well, when was the last time you were told to hush up about Jesus? Can I challenge you? Press pause now. Tell someone in your house today or online after the service something that Jesus has done for you. Let's listen to Anna making a joyful noise for God on her ukulele.
Okay. So okay. we are we are recording now, Rini. Off you go. Let us pray. Father, we come into your presence and ask you to give us all the heart of intercessors. We ask that your Holy Spirit will help us to be persistent in prayer until the breakthrough comes. Thank you for this powerful weapon of spiritual warfare and for your faithfulness in our lives. Thank you too for the guidance sheet which Alison prepares faithfully for our prayer days. We can't go through it all in a quarter of an hour, but as we are staying at home, we will be able to spend more time with you. We thank you too for the prayer diary, which reminds us of each other's needs and situations. We have a great opportunity at present as people are very fearful of the spread of coronavirus. Let, us see, let them see in us that perfect love casts out fear. And when given the opportunity, give us the courage to explain why we feel we have nothing to fear. Help us never to doubt that you have all situations under control, which includes cancelled operations, cancelled hospital appointments, employment situations and financial worries. We lift before you now, Lord, those unknown to us, but known to you, who are suffering at this time, having been bereaved with loneliness through separation from their families, for being unable to join together for coffee mornings and lunch club, which for some is the only social outlet, because of the necessary restrictions put on us at this time. We thank you for the technology that allows us to keep in touch with one another. The telephone, email and group meetings on the internet. Help us to be patient when we don't fully understand it. And thank you for the people who do explain it to us. We thank you for Potter Street Baptist Church, for the contacts that have been made between people by phone and email, who would not usually do that. For Alison and Tim, who have been so concerned for the welfare of us all, and for all the scripture references, which have assured us of your great love and mercy. Amen. And so we gather around this virtual table. Let's just take a minute, shall we? Just to empty our hearts and minds of everything that's not of God and concentrate on him. This is the Lord's table and we come at his invitation. And it's a wonderful thing, capable of touching us in so many different ways. It's meant to reinforce God's overwhelming love for all of us. Communion offers us a special opportunity to remember and give thanks for what Jesus did for us in his death and resurrection. Here at this virtual table, we are given the opportunity to reflect on the many examples of love and mercy which Jesus gave us throughout his life and ministry on earth. We remember so that we might follow in his footsteps. A path that requires commitment and the development of character. A path that in order to remain faithful, we will need to refresh our hearts and minds on a regular basis, because we want to be known as obedient to God's call. And we want to be known as fruitful in his plan and purpose. The bread speaks of welcome. 
Through it, God says to us, come to my table and eat with me. You are always welcome because I love you and I want you here. Lord Jesus, we come to you. The bread speaks of health. Through it, God says to us, come to me and let me feed you with myself. Let me heal the bits in you that are broken and fill the places that are empty. Feed on my endless love for you. Lord Jesus, we come to feed on you. The bread speaks of community. Through it, God says to us, come to my table and be part of my body. Come and belong to my people. It is where you belong, because I love you. Lord Jesus, we come to belong to you and to your people. The bread speaks of generosity. Through it, God says to us, look, I gave everything for you. I gave my only son who gave up his life for you. I gave my spirit to help you become like him. Come and let me make you like Jesus, generous and gracious and full of unfailing love. Let's pray. Lord of mercy, we confess to you now that we have sinned. Father, forgive us. You look inside and you ask us who we are and what we want. Forgive us our sins, we pray. Challenge us where we are unjust. Disturb us when we don't care. And transform our selfishness through the love of your Son and the life-giving power of your Spirit. Send us the Holy Spirit, that he may give us power to live as you have called us to live, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the good news. Christ came into the world to save sinners. We are sinners. He came to forgive us in our failure, to accept us as we are, to set us free from evil's power and make us what he meant us to be. Listen to him, for it is through him that his father tells us, you are accepted, you are forgiven, I will set you free. We lift our praise and give you glory. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together, shall we? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Paul the Apostle wrote, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces. This is my body, he said, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new way I'm going to relate to my people. This is a different time. This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat, the bread or drink the cup you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's share the bread, shall we? We eat as individuals, receiving what Jesus did for us and responding as individuals to everything he's done for us.
the wine speaks of the enormous lengths that God was prepared to go to for us. It speaks of enormous value. Through it, God says to us, look how much you are worth to me. I paid for you with my own blood. Drink this and remember that you are very precious to me and I love you this much. Lord Jesus, thank you. We believe and trust in you. The wine speaks of grace. Through it, God says to us, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad it seems, I forgive you. I can clean you up and give you a fresh start again and again. Drink this and remember that I forgive you because I love you. Lord Jesus, thank you. We believe and trust in you. The wine speaks of commitment. Through it, God says to us, I am committed to you. The blood of Jesus has sealed a binding covenant between you and me. I will never let you down. I will never let you go. And I will never stop loving you. Drink this and remember that. Lord Jesus, thank you. We believe and trust in you. The wine speaks of hope. Through it, God says to us, there is power in the blood of Jesus to make all things new. No one is too hard for me to save. Drink this and remember that I see you, not only as you are now, but also as you will one day be, full of life, health, holiness and power. We look forward to that, don't we? Lord Jesus, thank you. We believe and trust in you. The blood of Jesus given for us. We drink together as the body of Christ. Holy God, we have been nourished and had our thirst quenched through bread broken and wine poured in thanksgiving for your Son, Jesus Christ. Send us out to be generous in all that we do, that we might show through word and deed that you live among us, in us, and that you work through us. Well, we're nearly at the end of our service this morning on Palm Sunday at Potter Street Baptist Church. I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure in putting it together with all the contributions. Thank you so much for that. Don't forget to please keep praying for our NHS, especially at this time. Keep isolated and uh, and, and just remember them in your, in your prayers. They are doing such, such an amazing job. So please join with me in um, How Great Thou Art as our final hymn and meet online at the end of our service on our Zoom video conferencing. Until next time, goodbye.
Funniest thing, got to church, all locked up, no one there. Tim, it's locked down. Oh!